So I'm going live oh, now. Oh, Jason. Yeah. Okay. Before, do you need a headshot from me or do you have everything else? Oh, we're live now. Yeah, I, I got everything. Okay, great. Hello, and welcome to Jason and Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. At Cabinets HR, we're still doing our crowdfunding campaign. So it'd be great if you could donate and share the following link, which is HTTPS HR.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Ann Alzivo. Ann, are you ready to be great today? I am, Jason. Dr. Ann Alzivo is a senior biotech medical affairs executive and organizational design expert in the pharmaceutical biotech industry. As a seasoned C-suite advisor with 23 years of progressive CR&D and global medical affairs leadership experience with pharma, her focus is on, uh, is on the medical affairs, medical affairs capabilities build. Her company, I hope I say this right, R and R, RXR Communications specializes in launch readiness, globalization or change integration of medical affairs functions. And thank you for being here today. That's the credit mouthful you got going on, going on right there. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jason, for having me on the show. And it's Ann Arvizu. And yes, you, you almost got it right for RXER Communications. No, I, I've, I guess, complicated names. And I, I name my co company's complicated things as well. So how do you come up with the name of your company? I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they spend too much time naming their company, right? They, they didn't have to get it perfect. I mean, of course, the name is important at all. So I, I'm interested to know how do you come up with the name of your, your company? Does it actually mean anything? It was just like random letters. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I w originally got the download for RXER Communications, I was on a business trip in Puerto Rico. And I woke up at five o'clock in the morning, which is kind of one of the ways that I stay great, right? Like I get up early, have my coffee, do my journaling. And um, I, I you know, was supposed to be into the office at about eight o'clock that morning. And I all of a sudden just opened a journal and started writing. I wrote about 23 pages and it included that name, RXER Communications. And RX, of course, I'm a pharmacist. So the RX is like the R with the drop X. Um, it's your prescription and ER comes from emergency, right? Like people are used to that. So in the very beginning, when I started my company, it was, we're going to be your stat medical affairs solution. We're the ones that you can call right away and we'll help you with your, you know, medical communications needs. So that's how we started the company based on that name. So what exactly is a global medical information department? <laughs> Great question. Um, so uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, people are very familiar with sales and marketing, right? Because you see the um, advertisements, which I remember when they started, uh, and we never liked them when we're in the medical side, but we see advertisements for drug products on TV, uh, or we hear them on the radio, and that's the sales and marketing department. That's the commercialization of a product. But the research and development, that's the clinical research and development, that's the CRND that you read. And the medical affairs is how we spend time actually developing uh, programs and protocols to study the particular drug and get it out to the market. Once it's out in the market, the medical affairs department has multiple functions. And usually there's medical affairs professionals. We're MDs, we're PharmDs, we're PhDs, and we're the scientists that basically create the data, clean the data, disseminate the data, and make sure that everything is data aware and data driven for putting the patients first in the industry. So the medical information group, they answer frequently asked questions. They take calls from physicians or family members or uh, caregivers or even patients in different times. And they actually have to answer questions based on the drug can't be anything hiding it has to be completely transparent and it's data-based so it is a very very important compliance function within the industry so we're talking in some more detail when we go talk about your company but who do you actually work for is it the patient the doctor the, the insurance company someone completely different Yep, I've worked 23 years in the pharmaceutical industry and I've worked directly for them. So uh, I've been a director, an executive director, a global leader in the medical affairs space. Um, I had just worked my way up and then started my first company, you know, based on that to say, okay, I'm going to now launch out on my own and then support that industry with a suite of services that really help you get the right drug to the right patient at the right time, which is my trademarked tagline. 
And you you have customers, I'm presuming, all, you know, in like all 50 states. Oh, my, my customers are, well, the pharmaceutical industry is interesting because there's, there's a pocket in North Carolina, there's a pocket in, a big pocket in um, San Francisco, the biotech startups there. Um, there's a pocket in the Northeast, so New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and especially Cambridge, Boston area. So my clients are there and I'm in South Florida, so I do fly a lot for my clients except until COVID. So I did, uh, I did a lot of, you know, on on site with a lot of my clients in those areas. Are, are the rules or regulations or procedures the same everywhere or, or does it change depend on location? It depends on the country. So yes, they're just like we have an FDA, there are other medical boards that govern each of the countries. So very, very similar, I would say, but not exactly the same, but very similar with rules with what a patient can ingest and how that company has responsibility over getting information out for patients or doctors, et cetera. And your school trained to be a pharmacist? Yes. How, how does one become a pharmacist? I'm guessing it's like 20,000 years of school or <laughs> like something crazy. Well, you know, a, an old mentor of mine, one of my first bosses said, why do things the uh, easy way when the hard way is so readily available. <laughs> and I, I've always remembered that. And really my, my, uh, my pattern in, and in going into my farm D was I have a, I have a bachelor's from Villanova university. I also have a bachelor's in pharmacy from, uh, university of sciences in Philadelphia. At the time I was the last, one of the last pharmacist groups that actually graduated with their bachelor's from PCPNS, which was Philadelphia college of pharmacy and science. And then I went on to do my doctorate and my clinical um, rotations at University of Florida. So it took me a total of 11 years. And uh, during the last three years, I was working full time and uh, working at SmithKline Beecham, which eventually became GlaxoSmithKline. So I took the long route, but nowadays PharmDs and uh, even some MDs, they're, they're going through school these years in, in, in six years. It's a six year program, which is a doctoral program with uh, internships in between uh, and summers and hours that you have to retain. So it's very, very highly intensive program. I took the long route and the highly intensive prior to the easy way things are done now. So when someone finishes pharmacy school, what's like quote unquote normal for career progression? Like you finish pharmacy school and you're a pharmacist somewhere the rest of your life or is like, the, is there a career progression that you can go to? I think that, you know, that's actually, uh, that's an insightful, uh, that, that requires an insightful answer because previous to the last decade, I think a lot of pharmacists would either end up in community pharmacy in the Walgreens or the CVSs of the world, right? Or they would end up in hospital pharmacy, which, you know, one is ambulatory, meaning you are a patient that can actually walk into a pharmacy and one is, you know, uh, requires more care like our hospital patients today. Um, that, or there's the outpatient pharmacy, which is a little bit of both. So like maybe there's the outpatient pharmacy in a hospital, but now there's public health pharmacists, there's pharmacists in industry like me, the pharmaceutical industry, there's pharmacists creating their own company. So pharmacists turning into entrepreneurs like I have been. And um, the more I start to, I've been really just connecting with so many more pharmacist groups because of my involvement on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I see that, you know, really there's so many more applications of where pharmacists are going now. So what used to be looking like, hey, this is a alternative way that you can practice pharmacy is actually pretty mainstream. For me, when I was in industry for all these many years, doing research and development, writing protocols, um, being really there for the patient front and center and, and having a look at the data or writing, writing full protocols or clinical trial studies, this is an application of me as a scientist that I couldn't do in anywhere else. So for me, it was really invigorating and I've always loved what I've done and I've loved the science behind it and the research. So I could be wrong, but it's like recently there's been a whole lot more like um, medical startup companies in the tech field. Is any reason why this is like a, like a big, big uptick in this? I think that innovation in a time like this, innovation is, is critical. And I see an uptick as well in different medical and pharmacy, you know, personnel saying, I can see how to create this new way forward. Um, so for example, um, I, I know people who are uh, thyroid pharmacists now, or I, I see people saying, okay, I need this tech innovation in medicine. 
and maybe we could we could build this app. So I see people saying, I'm tired of waiting for my company to bring it to me. I'm going to bring it to the world. In, in my experience, I've gone through this pharmaceutical industry, which I loved, but I've also gone through some serious times of burnout. And you as an HR professional, um, you know, right, you know, that's one of the things that HR cares about, right? How are how, how is the bottom line going to be if we're going to have turnover on our teams? So there is a higher level of turnover in some um, in, in tech, medical-based companies and um, pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies because of these organizations getting leaner and flatter and uh, saying do more with less. And really, people are at the point going, my expertise are being squeezed out. So I see a better way. I'm going to go make a better way. And I think that has been maybe the blessing or the silver lining in COVID that people are saying, okay, enough. I now kind of want to do this. So burnout is really on my heart and in my expertise as a CNS specialist and, and somebody that's really studied CNS for so many years. That CNS is central nervous system. So depression, anxiety, all the things that really people are experiencing now because of being in lockdown for so long and, and what they're going through, it's like this, this way to move forward. So the newest brand that we have, like my podcast, the Corpreneur podcast, is how to live from a central place. And I think that's, you know, just like I'm doing it, so many other people are doing it as well. So, and I, I think for a while, and I could be wrong, but for a while, there's been always a shortage of nurses everywhere. And there's a shortage of like health professionals in general, like in rural, like in rural areas. Has this always been like this? And if so, how do we how do we fix this, or can it be fixed? It hasn't been. Um, it seems that there has been a huge increase in the number of seats in, um, for example, in pharmacy schools. There were more pharmacists graduating the past couple of years than there were jobs available. But then, like you said, that there's this shortage, right? There's a shortage in rural areas. So where the pharmacy schools or the nursing schools or the medical schools are, are the urban areas. And obviously people, when they're getting out of school, they all look for the highest paying jobs. So that's a little conundrum with, hey, where am I actually going to go? Do I want to be, remember like the movie uh, a long time ago, Doc Holiday? Do I'll, I want to go? I'll just, I'll just think about that. Yeah, I'll right? just think about exactly. that. Yeah. Like who wants to actually move to that um, rural place? You know, I know a physician who actually did just that and she operated many years in the basement of a church. And I just heard her story not too long ago and I loved it. Um, and now she has a, a, a sort of a coaching business for other physicians, similar to what I do with pharmacists. And uh, it's just, again, it flips the switch on innovation. And I think, um, you know, now that there's also online availability, that's, a, that's another reason that if physicians or, or pharmacists or nurses are really burned out with what they do, want to, what they're doing in organiza organizations right now, because they're not getting the support they need, or they're pressurized in their job, they're just leaving and going to create and innovate something just like you, you have, and I have with our own companies. Yeah. And then like, you know, you, you, you finish medical school, you have like hundred thousand dollars in debt. Are you going to go to a big city where you get paid more money and pay it off quicker? Or do you go to a small town in America and not making us you know, as much money? Right. Right. Great point. I mean, it took too. me, it took me 10 years to pay off $150,000 in debt. Absolutely. To your point. So that's the other problem, I think, with the medical field, too. Like, this, I mean, the, the high debt the medical people go through afterwards, right? I don't think a lot of people realize that, right? And then that the insurance people, they got to know how to do a business. It's all these things they got to do, right? It's, I don't know how they deal with it. The thing is a big challenge for them. It's a challenge. Um, I think it's just something that it's, it's sort of like that necessary evil, right? And it's just like with business. Uh, I know you, and I know a little bit about your story and myself as well. I've put hundreds of thousands of dollars into my business, right? You make, you use money to make money mm -hmm. and um, getting student loans for me was the only recourse. And so I'm grateful that I was able to get government student loans. I'm grateful that I was able to uh, make the kind of money afterwards to pay it off. But yeah, you, there's very little left for yourself for those lean years when you're paying off. Um, but on the other side of it, it's a little bit of like, oh, there's some breathing room. I can buy a house or I can get a car I want or whatever. So yeah, it's just and, uh, patience to get there. And I, and I have to presume that a medical school or pharmacy school or the case it be, they, they, they don't teach how to run a business. It's just strictly medical oh, no. stuff, right? 
Oh, no, okay. they don't. That's one of the things that I do in my program. I, I, I call it everything you didn't learn in pharmacy school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so two part question. Hope I asked this right. Tell us something that is still going on in, in the medicine right now that we, you, we actually do good, great at, but we don't realize how great we are at it. And something that we're actually kind of bad at that we need, we need to get better at that most people, people don't know. So in general, in medicine? Yes. Or, okay. In medicine. What are we great at in medicine? Well, I think this past year has been a, uh, a huge display of what we're great at when we want a, to, a coming together of who we are as a nation and the rolling out of the vaccines has been absolutely amazing. You know, and I know like news media would love to pick up on what's bad or what's going on or what, you know, didn't go right. But I just spent three hours at a park in Western Florida on, on Saturday. And, you know, I was a, the Chicago song Saturday <laughs> in the park. That's how I spent my Saturday. And I was waiting for my vaccine and it was seamless. It was well run. People were happy in Broward County. We're a very uh, mixed cultural group. And it was just really bringing out the best in everybody. Two nurses per tent. It looked like a military base or it looked like um, a, you know, a mission field. Like when I've been on in other countries on mission fields, it was just so well laid out. And, uh, and we also got the vaccine out in record time in multiple countries. So that's been a huge coming together. The, the medical community globalized last year. I was on many, many calls um, with, with over a hundred countries on any given Zoom line. And that was just so, you could feel the energy of how can we do this together? And when you have collective minds and collective hearts really just focusing on this one thing, people don't realize how powerful that is. So I'd say that's something we get right. Um, what we get wrong, which is, it's part of the system, but I don't know how to fix it, is insurance, right? If I wanna go see my doctor, at Cleveland Clinic tomorrow, I get about 15 minutes with her or him. And that's, that's a, it's sad that you can't have, you know, as a patient, I'm going in as a very educated patient. And my, my healthcare team knows who I am. So they'd say, well, you know what, we're going to talk shop, we'll, we'll talk right away. But for the average patient who isn't doing their research or doesn't know what's going on, or maybe is not a perfect historian we call in medicine, meaning they don't have their meds right with them, or they don't have, you know, all their vac straight and some, you know, cousin so-and-so told them this, or they read this on the internet, they're going in with maybe misinformation and they're not getting enough time. And I feel like patients are, are knowing that they don't get enough time with their doctors and therefore healthcare has gone down and doctors and healthcare practitioners in general, pharmacists, physicians, whoever, nurses, they know they know it too. They don't have enough time with their patients, and um, that that's a cause for burnout. And burnout's going to lead to mistakes. So finally, pharmacists, for example, are are in in industry as well as in um, community pharmacy, which a lot of my family members are. Uh, they're learning to speak up and say, "Yeah, we've we've got to have more time here. We've got to have some space, some breathing space. If not, you know, this could lead to a fatal error." Do pharmacists have to get malpractice insurance like the like doctors do? Yeah, they can. Yes, they okay. can. They don't have to, but they can, and they should. <laughs> if you're in public practice, yeah, you should have it. Okay. Um, so what's what's some fun things about about being a pharmacist? Like, what what's the advantage of being a pharmacist? Um, the advantage for me was when uh, I knew I wanted to go into healthcare, so I. Um, volunteered in an ER. I was a lifeguard. I loved doing all that. I had a prior degree and um, I knew just I had to go into the healthcare field, but I really didn't want to cut anybody open. And I really didn't want to see all the blood and smell all the smells. So I think that was my advantage. But my original advantage was my, my, my heart and soul, even before I graduated from pharmacy school was di directly to go into the industry, go into clinical research. I'm a researcher. You see all the books behind me. I'm, a, I'm an avid reader, avid researcher, and um, I'm the no stone unturned type of personality as a, as kind of like, you know, my own personal microscope is myself, my clients, and everything that I do in my business. So I think that was a huge advantage for the field, at least in my perspective. 
And so what got you started on the path of being an entrepreneur? Like what, what kicked that off for you? What made that change in your life? Yeah. Um, originally it was transitioning out of the pharmaceutical industry and, and building RXER communications. And then uh, that is really what started my first company, this RXER communications, which I still, it's my, it's my main company. It's my bread and butter. I've learned how to be one of those, you know, I could say I'm a seven figure entrepreneur. I know how to, um, uh, you know, I know how to build a business, but I feel like for me, it was, it's a calling business is a calling entrepreneurship for me was a calling because that download came to me in Puerto Rico on that business trip. I wrote out the whole model of a consulting firm and a communications firm. And when I took it back to Miami, I, I, you know, consulted with a consultant and he said, oh yeah, this is exactly, this is exactly the model. So literally it came through me, but it came through me very, um, very timely where I, I was about to get married. Uh, I was about to become uh, a, a wife and a mom all at the same time because I was marrying a man with kids. So I became a stepmom. And for me, because I'm that go-getter, I'm like, great, perfect family in a box. Like, this is great. Let's, <laughs> let's get it all done. Um, that was just perfect for my personality, but it was also a huge challenge. And so having, having like this download, I had no idea how much it would serve me my first couple of years in marriage when my husband had to be at work and I was taking care of the kids, but I could also run my business. And so that was amazing. And, and it was seamless. It was just exactly what I do. It's still being a pharmacist. It was still doing medical information and medical communications, but on my own. And then later things started to progress. So in 2008, uh, boy, that was a, quite a doozy of a year. And that was when really the real story of entrepreneurship came through to me. When I started my company, I knew that I had to be the entrepreneur that RxCR required. So I started going to every Tony Robbins event. I walked on fire. I was jumping off cliffs and trapezes and doing all the things, right? I was doing all the interpersonal stuff. I became a certified life coach, certified consultant, certified in NLP. At one point I was joking. I was so certified. I'm certifiable. And, um, I just, I just kept doing all that because I was feeding myself as an entrepreneur and that helped me take more and more risks. So I incorporated all that. And then I realized this is what's missing. So when 2008 hit, I lost everything. We lost our house. We lost an apartment. My mother-in-law died. My dog died. I had a cat die. Like we had to move across the country to Pennsylvania, the one place I didn't want to be. And I'm taken away from everything that balances my life, my, my social, my church, my, you know, the things I love to do, my business was uprooted and, and resettling on that. I'm looking back at all these life balance models and none of them really helped to pick you up when you got back down. None of them really had a body, mind, spirit connection. And so the corporate brand was born. I started teaching it under the guise of, it was called CCI Coach Institute at the time. And now this year, last year, I, um, I launched the podcast and CORE is an acronym in my world. And this is what keeps me great, Jason. So my negative CORE for is what last year was and what 20, 2008 was. And that was chaotic, overwhelmed, resistant, and exhausted. That's the negative CORE for. And the positive core for in a corepreneur's life is being centered, open, resilient, and energized. That's what really drives a business forward is the owner and the deep work that we do need to do to keep ourselves centered, open, resilient, and energized so that we can bring our gifts to the world, so that we can shine in our companies and know how to be guided and led and co-create versus just doing things in our own strength and um, knowing the difference there is huge for entrepreneurs. It's also huge for corporate executives today because we are being squeezed and then bombarded on all sides like we were last year. And so this core four, is this something you came up with yourself or you learned it from somewhere else? No, that's mine. That's all mine. Yep. We, I, I have the trademark on centered, open, resilient, and energized. I have the trademark on corepreneur. I have the trademark on affluent minds, which is the book that I wrote last year. Um, that talks about the model and that model really, it looks like this, if you can see it live, right? It's what is in your core. So, so just starting with my industry as an example, my industry loves to say that the patient is the center of all they do, but come, you know, our first quarter 
uh, the shareholders really drive a lot of what we do because they'll de they'll determine if we're letting go of staff, letting go of key contracts, because are the numbers up or down? And really, if if you're supposed to be driven by the patient and yet the almighty dollar is the thing that's driving you, there's a disconnect. And then there's a disconnect on you know the pharmacist or the physician or whoever's walking into becoming that medical affairs professional. They, they say, I want to do this thing. I want to, I buy into the higher vision of making my patients' lives better and doing the research that it takes to get there. But yet there's a disconnect if you're telling me that I don't matter or my budget has to shrink or I'm so exhausted and I've worked an eight hour day and now I have to travel for my job. And, and it's, it's, you know, one thing after another. And my clients who are all very high performing professionals in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. They are VPs, they're chief medical officers. And on one hand, they hire me to build their medical affairs departments out like medical information and medical communications. But on the other hand, we, we get to that phone call on Monday where they go, and I am so exhausted. That's the, that's part of the negative. And like, there I am, I'm listening for it. So that's been something that I've been developing over 11 years and is coming out in my Corpreneur Academy programs this year. So that's just something that, um, you know, yeah, to your point, I've developed it myself. I've lived through it myself. So I've been like client patient zero <laughs> and I teach it to everyone I can. So who's your Corpreneur course for? So it's for people like me that have been in high tech, high touch, type of environments like the pharmaceutical industry or biotech industry or women in tech or women in STEM, where we're upholding the major parts of the organization as middle-level employees, as middle-level employees, middle-level executives, like directors, senior directors, and vice presidents, where you're not the C-suite, but you still have to convince them to grow your team. You have to do business cases to grow your team. You're taking care of Everybody under you, like I've had teams of 30, 50, 60, and 100 in different companies that I've worked for. So you're taking care of all your leaders, directors under you, you're protecting them, and you're still upholding the organization. And here's what happens to you in between. And especially as a woman leader, I'm like, you know what? There are women that I know. I had a, I had a client this year who was a VP at a bank, and she came to me, even though that's a little outside of my industry, she came to me and she said, I just quit my day job. I said, really? I mean, shouldn't you have had a plan? Like I have something on my website that's free that says, you know, this is your corporate to freedom checklist. Did you do my checklist? And she's like, no, I just quit. I couldn't take it anymore. And I think people are getting to that point. I think that's something that also got um, augmented in terms of what the pandemic could do for people. They decided what really is important to them and what was not important to them it, would also fall by the wayside. And in her case, that was her job. She's like, yes, it's important. I like the salary, but I'm not worth, it's not worth me doing that anymore or being out of integrity with my heart. So it's really for anybody in that type of situation that feels disaligned or wants to start their own business or wants to be free, right? You want to hop on that, you know, fast track to freedom, I call it, because I've been there, done that. I know what it's taken me to do that. And now I help other people. I know how to help other people create a seven figure business so much faster than I did over the years. So yeah, they're really appreciative that this is here. And it was something that I hope to do before the pandemic. We did a women's retreat in November of 2019. Last year, I, I launched the book and uh, the podcast. And then it was pe person after person saying, Anne, coach me, coach me, please help. You know, and I'm like, well, I don't do individual coaching, but I have this program and I can get you all in there. <laughs> so, so come join the program. So we're going to launch the next version of that program again this year. And um, yeah, so that's where I am. So, Anne, you know, being an entrepreneur is not easy. It, it's, it's, you know, it's hard, you know, a lot of stuff going on. Is being a female entrepreneur, does it make it even harder or is there actually advantages to being a female entrepreneur? Hmm. I, I don't look at, is something hard or easy? I would like to flip that question on its head and say, you know, how easy is it to be a woman entrepreneur these days, actually? Um, yes, you might say in one way, it's more 
challenging for women because women are starting businesses faster than other than than men. However, they're also failing faster than men. So women need a little bit more of that high touch coaching because they tend to doubt themselves more. When men start a business, here's my thing, here's my thought, and I'll give you a perfect case in point. I just got a text last week. I mean, it said something to the effect of, okay, you know what, I'm, I'll even read it. It was, you know what, I wanna tell you, Anne, that I filed for a business name finally today. But immediately after I felt hesitancy and fear, I believe in my idea, but then my neighbor essentially knocked it down without me asking for his feedback. This is a woman that all of a sudden she goes to her neighbor saying, hey, I'm gonna do this, I just incorporated. And immediately she gets knocked down. So Jason, I don't know if you've gone through that, like, but sometimes when you're thinking of creating a business, there are those naysayers around you, whether they're male or female doesn't really matter. Um, but they try to keep us safe and they try to keep us in our comfort zone, right? So she's a physical therapist, I'm a pharmacist. I've had those people in my life and I've just had to kind of put my, spiritual blinders and my spiritual, you know, earplugs in and just say, I'm going to go for where my vision is telling me to go. And, but it's not, not everybody has that sense. Like I have, I'm, I'm, I'm more of an extroverted person. I know that I know that I know I'm spiritually guided. I'm a woman of faith. So I feel like I have some foundation in there that's allowed me, although I've had my, you know, insecurity moments too, but women tend to have those insecurity moments more. So I, you know, when, you know, blah, 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 the, the text went on, now I'm feeling this and that and the other thing. And I said, don't listen to your neighbor or the voice of fear, you know, da, da, da. And, and so I flipped it for her real quick because we do some laser coaching by text. Um, but that's kind of, I think, the challenge that women leaders have. They've got to break the bad ceilings, but some of those ceilings are right in their own minds. And, and talk about this, right? So I've been doing startup entrepreneurship like a few years. And like, it's like always when there's, there's female entrepreneurs, they're pretty much the only one in the room, right? How do you convince a female entrepreneur to be okay with being the only person, the only female in the room and how they take, put that to their advantage? <laughs> I've always done that. I've always been that female in the room until recently when I've joined some women's entrepreneur groups. And those have been really, really good for me. Um, when I come out of those like women only very estrogen heavy, but like super awesome environments. And I'm back in that space where it's, you know, back in my other world, like the Tony Robbins world, it's, it is the good old boys club in many, many ways in my industry and at the very high levels of leadership. And just being my authentic feminine self is for, for me, the key and being unapologetic because I've had men in my life as leaders where I've either, you know, I've been a director under this particular VP or what have you that are like, you know, Anne, you need to be a nice, calm leader, or you need to talk slower. And I'm like, you know what? You hired me because I was the spastic, passionate leader that completely built this amazing team. So now you want me, the person who built this fabulous team that's gotten the, the exceeds on my contracts, now you want me to change? And the answer is no. So I would say to women, just be yourself and stand up for who you are. You know, they kill them with kindness, not you don't need to, you, do, you don't need to fight back or, or press back with men because um, they will, you know, men have a different competitive edge. And when women try to be like men, it just doesn't work. When women just, I don't need to be competitive. For me, partnership is key. For me, collaboration is key. C competition doesn't exist in my world. So when, when I've had men coaches in the past, they're like, well, who's your competitor? I'm like, but I don't care. I'm in a category of one. So who cares? Right? <laughs> so I think being my authentic self has served me not to listen to all the noise and all the voices out there, but to be who I am in my core and know what that is. And that's part of what I teach in my program for women that need to learn that. So, and earlier, you were kind of joking around about all the certification you got. But in reality, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you, you have to always be learning. Can you talk about yes. the importance of always be learning as an entrepreneur? Oh, totally. I am, I am unabashedly a lifelong learner. I definitely, these are my books that you see probably two of the three shelves. And then there's more books over there that I don't even have space for. And, um, and, and, you know, I was recently on a, uh, a call with my, my, my ladies group, I call it my ladies entrepreneur group called the trust. 
and we shared books that we're all reading. So 30 women came up with these books and I'm writing them down and I'm ordering them on Amazon as we're talking. And I think that's, that's a big thing. Um, I always have coaches in my life, just like I am a coach. I'm always, a, 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 I'm a coach, a mentor, and a consultant, and I have those people in my life. So I have no problem. Of course, I'm at a place financially where that it's fine to do this, but I have, um, I always have coaches. I have two coaches right now, one for my life, one for my business. Um, I've been thinking recently on some, some heartfelt personal situations that I want to work through. And I'm thinking, okay, it's time for maybe some, some therapy around that. Maybe just to have someone safe to talk to other than my family and my friends and my coaches, because coaching is not the same as therapy or counseling. So having maybe a, a counselor to go to is nice. Um, consultants for my business. When I was going to launch my book, my book, I went to someone and I, I paid her for the day. And I said, teach me how you created your New York times bestseller and, or, you know, your best-selling book. And then we, we just mapped that out. So, so I think that it's super, super important, um, to be learning from all avenues and from people and not to isolate yourselves, not to just get caught up in the books and reading stuff online, but to avail yourself to other people that can lift you up. So the same thing that I, like, I am not just preaching to the choir. I do it in my own life as well. Why do so many people feel like they don't need a, a coach? Like they, I, I can do everything myself. I can just Google stuff and learn on my own. Why are so many people anti-coach, so to speak? I don't know. I think uh, it's it's really a shame that they'll go and spend uh, $150 or $250 on a spa day or, you know, a manicure, pedicure or a dinner out, but they won't change it on a transformational life-changing session with a professional that can help them that literally within 45 minutes to an hour can, can absolutely change their world and hear what they're, you know, we're, we're trained with multiple, um, uh, different techniques and, and experiences that we can use. So for my coach training program, I teach 16 different ways that my coaches can change their worlds, you know, of the worlds of themselves and of their clients, because it starts with you first. So for me, um, I, I know the process of coaching, but I'm not going to coach myself. And I literally like open my, I have to open myself and not have pride that I know better than my coaches. And I let myself go and be led by my, my coaches. When I leave them, they might even have a little bit less experience than I do, but their intention for me is transformation at the end of my session. So, so I open myself to that. That's the O in core, right? Is, is open, being open and centered, centered on what really is your truest values. What are you tapping into? What's God put in you um, that is your truth at the very center of your being that you know that I'm in alignment with where I'm going with my business and I'm in integrity with it. And once you unlock that, like you saw my core wheel earlier, I have a, I have a, a thing where the, the wheels are disconnected, but when they're aligned, that's when your power can get back and be released. So being open to being that kind of learner is so super important, whether it's with people or on your own. And so can you walk us through how you found your coaches? Like what is your process for doing that? Yeah. So when uh, the process of the corpreneur and the coaching and how I have found, how I have found my personal coaches that I hire, is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Um, this year it was, I was a part of a program that coaches were available and I decided, okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, the coaching program was a couple, you know, it was a few thousand, $5,000. I said, that's fine. No problem. That's, in, that's an investment in myself. So of those coaches, I was allowed to pick and I decided that these were the perfect coaches for me and they were. And so we, you know, usually I'll seek out coaches or mentors. So for example, um, Allie Brown's been a mentor in my life, Sage Levine. These are people that have coaching programs like me. So I go to people who are like-minded and uh, similar, you know, they, they have a similar uh, background, they, they have a similar knowledge, but I, I could, you know, they could be teaching from a very different vantage point. And I feel that the vantage points are extremely helpful because they're going to pick up on something that if I'm left to my own accord and in my own group, I wouldn't pick up on. So I, I really would say, get out of your comfort zone 
and and find someone really that's why my program the corporate program is so much more broad it's for anybody and then we're going to be developing a team of coaches that is based on different faiths, different backgrounds, different genders, different, um, you know, for pharmacists only or for all healthcare professionals. And, and that really makes a great conversation when you all, when you all come together and, and you can pick and choose from that. And can you talk about the importance of the people around you, whether it's your spouse or close family or close friends of actually being supportive of you, of being an entrepreneur? Yes, that's, a phenomenal question because I think that a lot of entrepreneurs think everybody around me should support me. And what the very first thing that usually happens is that almost nobody supports you in the very beginning, that you have to learn how to create your message in a way that it's received by others, that you have early adopters around you. Now, I have a very supportive spouse. And I've had a very supportive spouse from the very beginning, before he even was my spouse, he knew that I was probably gonna start my own company. And we talked about it and he had, maybe I would say the inkling, I had this giant entrepreneurial gene, but he had the inkling of it, he understood it. And we've had our ups and downs over the years where I've had to kind of pull away and say, this is my vision, or I've had to learn some hard lessons with him over the years. But in general, for the most part, he is my biggest supporter, which is amazing. And a lot of the women entrepreneurs I know, when they've gotten to that point of being able to clarify their message in such a way where it's powerful enough for their house or their household um, to understand, they get it. Now, in, in, in terms of I'm, I'm a stepmom, so stepmom or mom or doesn't matter. I know so many women who are like, my kids are like, Okay, whatever she's doing in her office, it really doesn't matter to us. So, so there's that apathy that sometimes you get in your family too. And then there's that naysayer, right? There's always the uncle so-and-so or the brother or the sister or someone that have been in your past or like, you know, the ex or the whatever, um, or the friend that is like, why would you want to do that? Just like the neighbor in my friend's case, right? In my client's case. There's always going to be the people around you that are right around you that want to somehow in some way, in their own loving way, say, why don't you just stay as a physical therapist? Why would you start your own company? That's a terrible idea. And they're only doing it because they don't know any better. And most of the time when people say that to you, they're not an entrepreneur. So they don't know what it's like to um, reproduce their salary that, that, you know, okay, I can say I'm in that top 2% category of all women entrepreneurs. I can actually say that now, but for me, that's not any kind of badge of honor. That just says, I know how to reproduce my salary. I know how to pay my staff. I know how to be fair. I'm accountable to my CPA. Like there's a lot of learning in it. So, and there's a lot of, it's a big learning curve. You've got to just move past. Um, I think Bruce Wilkinson was the author. I can't remember the book, but I think he called them border bullies. You've got to move past the border bullies on the way to your dream, because there's always going to be that, oh man, I'm, I'm that, that next step is me launching something online or that next step is, oh my gosh, I have to do a live with Jason Kavnis on the experience. Oh my gosh. Right. You, I get on here. I don't even know if we're going to be on video. I just am ready. I, I don't know if, um, and I'm not looking my best right now, but I'm at least okay, decent, right? I, I should have put mascara on or something, but it's like, okay. And you go, hey, do you mind? We're live streaming like all over the world. And I'm like, no, okay, I'm ready to go. And maybe that's part of my personality and my training and the fact that I've kind of been in this space. But if you would have asked me this a year ago, I would have been like, oh my gosh, what's a live stream? Oh no, you know, so, so you just keep moving past your own and your other's insecurities and you walk with the insecurity or you walk with the fear until you walk right past it and you will get there. So talk about this. I think a lot of people, they say, I'm going to start my own business because I don't want a boss, a boss anymore, right? Not realizing that you have hundreds more boss, like your customers, your clients, your vendors, on and on and on, right? Can you talk about how you actually have more bosses, you have your own company and how you, how do you personally like manage and like all those different bosses you have? Yeah, um, there's a nuance, I'd say, because having your own company, you're still yourself. 
And in some ways I'm coming in to build someone else's organization at RXCR, or I'm coming in to build someone's business as Corpreneur, Corpreneur Academy. And when my clients come into my inner circle programs and stuff like that, and when they are hiring me for a VIP day, right, they're paying me a lot of money to sit there and, and, and they're hiring me, right? So I'm there, I'm there vendor for that day, if you will. I'm their support team and they're my boss, if you will, if, if I want to look at it that way, but they're looking at me where it's a mutual partnership. And I think that that is something that is a significant piece that companies get wrong. They come in with the servant, 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 and then they're going to be rolled over or they're not going to be able to give the, the, the right advice to the client. There has to be a place where you know that you know that what your gift is or what your talent is, is coming to your client. And yes, you're giving your information and they're buying it, but um, you're just as assured of your expertise as they are of theirs. So in, in big pharma, they know their drug better than I ever will. They know their team better than I ever will, but I know the models that work and they have to open to me so that I can give them the best solution. But the same way happens, you know, with an individual client. So just knowing that there's a balance there, knowing who you are as the boss, the queen, the king of your company, and, and knowing like that your team, the people that you're building, like the HR professionals in your case, that you're building to serve your clients and the, and the people, the coaches that I'm building to serve mine, these are experts that people are going to. So there has to be a mutual. And so I build that into when we're writing contracts, that's one way to do it. Um, I, I state that up front, and that's another way that my coaches and, and my mentors have done that with me. And I think that's really important. For your two companies, how do you find your, your customers? You have a marketing plan to word of mouth. How, how do you do that? RXCR Communications has been, you know, in business for quite some time. And it really comes down to there's no marketing. There's I post on social media. I go to, obviously before COVID, I was traveling to a lot of meetings. I speak as an expert and people see me and know me as an expert. So it's one of those like Bob Bergisms, like people know, like, and trust me. So they refer me or they reach out to me when they know they need me. And I have been very blessed to know, like, I really don't have to do so much marketing. Of course, marketing is, can include a website. So I have a website, but um, for the core brand, it was a matter of getting the message out. It was not as black and white, cut and dry, but now they see, hey, I get it. It's an exact, really, it's basically who you were as a person in the industry and who your clients are as a person that you're serving now. So it's a perfect offshoot of what we're doing now, but I had to, I had to market that more. So then building up social media has been important, but I don't see it as that important. I'd rather do conversations like this and just organically build uh, a following. So last year I was, you know, I was on the phone with my producer a couple of weeks ago and we just calculated in about 12 episodes. And I think I have about 15 episodes out now in 12 episodes, I've had about 37,000 downloads. So people are listening. And what they see on social media, because there's all these algorithms and people know about those algorithms is nobody wants to press like or share. Um, so you, you know, you post something you think is profound and you get crickets, but you do something like this and you get, Hey, 10 more people like signed up for my list or 20 more people signed up for my list because they want to know more of what I have to say. So I feel like this kind of stuff is, is way more important than all that. And people are wasting money on all the noise out there on social media. I'm not saying to get rid of it completely, but I've, I've wasted time, money, and effort. And I like had to put the brakes on that last year and say, hmm, I'm going to try some new things this year. And this is one of them, for example. And how do you prioritize your, your time between your two companies? Yeah, uh, I would say it's, for a while, it was 90-10. 90, 90% RXCR, 10% Corpreneur. So it's like, if you have two companies, if you want one to continue, then you need to figure out how to get yourself out. You put yourself squarely in the owner position and not just the CEO position, because in the CEO position, you're still operational. 
you're really CEO and COO and janitor and, <laughs> you know, bathroom washer. Like you're just everything in your da business. Data, data entry clerk. You're, yeah, your data entry, you're the admin, you're everything until you've built that company. So RxCR I had built and I had team. And, um, and so that was able to run on its own for a while. And then last year we had some problems. We had to shift. So I, I switched back into like, we were, we were kind of saying, okay, I'm gonna build this company as I let this company kind of just broadly just go by itself and then, and then, and then scale out. So when this company took a dip, then Corpreneur needed to like be like, okay, full throttle here. So I'd say right now I'm at a balance of around 50, 50. But um, if you are trying to leave a company or, or start a second company while you're running one company, it's gotta be more like 90, 10. And then you have to decide, is this company going down? Will I go, well, this company goes up. Is this a means to this new end or am I going to use both? So I've had to try and create um, a business and marketing plan so that both are gonna eventually run without me. And one has an unfair advantage of being around since 2002 in my mind. And the other is, you know, okay, this, this wheel that I got, which was a download in 2009, it's 11 years and now it's going on to its 12th year. So this 12th year was, I've done lots of online programs in the past. I had nine websites that came down, went through some stuff and now putting it back out there in a much simpler way and deciding I wanna do my launch my way, you know, like the Frank Sinatra song and just going to do it my way and, and see what really matters to me. Because I think a lot of people get caught up in going, oh, I did this course. I did this. And I'm supposed to launch this way and this way. And I have to do this many memes on social media. And the answer is no, you don't. You have to be driven by your core because all that stuff will squeeze out your passion and your, your launch will fail. So, <laughs> so it really depends is the answer. And it really has to come from your heart. And last year you wrote Affluent Minds. Can you talk about that process? Like why did you decide to write a book? How that yeah. all came together for you? Yeah, it, it came together because number one, I needed copyright on some of my information that I was going to launch this year. And I decided it was the right time to write this, um, you know, a small version of the second book that I'm writing right now. And um, the, the book I'm writing right now is going to be probably well over 200 pages. This book is 90. And I really wanted to just sort of say, okay, in the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was losing their minds. I just came back from a business trip and it was the end of February when I was predicting everybody was gonna go into lockdown and nobody was listening to me. I'm like, I'm a pharmacist, I'm in biotech. I have vaccine experience. Let me tell you, we're gonna go into lockdown. And then we did. And when we did, everybody was like, okay, there's no toilet paper. Everybody was freaking out. First responders were out there and it was, you know, the supermarket personnel and the guy at the pharmacy or the gal at the pharmacy or the nurses. And we were worried about them. And we were worried about, you know, how do we clean our groceries when we get them and all this kind of stuff. And people like me, you know, I'm over, I'm over 50. I have asthma. Like if you have kind of, if you were in that category where you were higher risk or vulnerable, you're, you were even a little bit more worried about what's going on when we didn't have enough experience and, and, and enough information at that point. And so, um, we are lucky enough that I live here in my home in Miramar, but I also have a home in the Florida Keys. So my father-in-law, who was also vulnerable, was coming to visit for a few weeks because my sister-in-law is a nurse and she's a nurse at the VA and she was going to go in and work with vulnerable patients in COVID on a COVID floor. And we didn't want my father-in-law to be affected. So he came to live here at our main home. And I said, I'm going to go for the next three weeks. So just so we know like who's okay and who's not. And, you know, and, and I was having a sore throat at the time. So I said, I'm not going to put him at risk. And I went and I stayed alone. So I self-isolated in the Keys. The good thing about that was if you've ever heard of what um, great leaders like Einstein has done, you know, the, the, the modern term for it is called white space. Um, but, you know, it's this timeless or no time situation. I was literally in lockdown and I could write when I wanted to write. I could get up and it, I wasn't in this nine to five anymore. I had a couple of contracts that put, that got put on hold because they didn't know if they had to fire their own team. And they were pulling contracts for contractors before firing their team, which was like a blessing in disguise. Like I had a, a vortex 
of time that I could actually just sit and write with my book and get out some of my, my thoughts. And my initial thoughts were, we all have these naysayers, these time wasters, these time stealers, and we all have these negative thoughts. And when you get stuck in your head, you're dead. So, so you have a body, you have this body that like, you have this body that like, this is the life that we live. This is the, the main part of who we are on planet earth. This is Jason. This is Anne. This is you. This is me. But we also have a mind and the mind, man, when we get caught up here and we're overthinking stuff, we could just absolutely trash our own dreams. This is where that get stuck in your head, your dead goes. And then we have a spirit that knows better that really that's where that we're receptor. That's where those downloads download into and our great ideas come. Like when you're in the shower or when you're out for a walk, especially when you don't have a pen and paper handy, <laughs> that's when the great ideas for your company come. And that's, that's that spirit. So I call that matter moxie and muse. So the first part of my book is an acrostic. I take values and and real values that A is for affluent and F is for faith. And these are the qualities of what makes a great servant leader. And then I go through that. So for example, S is for steady and steady stands for integrity in your life. So it tried to open up people's minds because everybody was going crazy and everybody was, you know, this was the, I, I felt like that was the need that we needed by summer last year. Then, you know, the, all the political situation and then um, the racial situation and all these things. And I was so grateful that I had a chance to write these values down and get them out to the world. And people were like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed. And then the second part of the book, I talked about um, some disciplines that once you have those values straight and you've kind of done a little clarifying self-work, then you need disciplines to get your business where you really want it to be. You put yourself not just in the nine to five, like you've been taught to do, but you learn disciplines that are truly going to launch your business to the levels that you really see it going to be. And um, so for example, there's a big difference between uh, perseverance or perseverance and um, determination or persistence. So perseverance, you know, great quote from Langston Hughes, that's in my book. It says, I have, hang on, I got to put my glasses on. <laughs> I have discovered in life that there are ways of getting almost anywhere, anywhere you really want to go if you want to go. And, you know, I say that pers perseverance is often thought of to be a quality or character trait. I write in my book, however, make no mistake, it is a learned and integrated dis discipline. It is something you choose in the face of hardship. You decide to go on head down, teeth bared to wait out the storm. And the biggest difference between perseverance and persistence is that perseverance usually comes from hardship in, or in spite of hardship. So we learn and we can go, you know, with some of these disciplines. And then, then the last part, I actually give the wheel and I teach people the method, the very, you know, the main part of the method and give them coaching questions. And, you know, I really thought as an author, that the first two parts of the book I thought was most important. The third part of the book, my publisher came back to me and they said, can you write a few more words? Can you do, can you do something a little experiential? And I said, sure. So I wrote about the wheel and I started doing some coaching sessions. Like basically like I would do a coaching session live, I wrote questions out at the end. And you know, on Amazon and my reviews and on Goodreads, people are like, that was the most important part of the book. Thank you. I actually wrote it all. I wrote all over it and I answered all the questions. That was really great. And so I'm glad it was helpful for people because for me, it wasn't even the real book. It was, you know, I, I meant to do it because it was the right thing, the right message for the right time. But it was also for me, I needed to get some copyright. I wanted to protect my work and, and get my work out into the world in a very quick and significant way. Yeah, was there something that about the book writing process was harder than you thought, or easier than you thought, or just a, was this a complete total surprise? It, I, I have the main book has been really harder than I thought. It's like I've had to live through every single aspect of it. So the main book that's really coming out, which that proposal will go out and be picked up by the end of this year. I've already been talking with you know some. I have editors on my team. I have a ghostwriter. I have, you know, we're, we're being introduced to agents, all that kind of stuff. So that's a fun process. That has been hard. This book came so easily that it shocked me. And I think it was because I was in that space that I had like that open, I had that open channel 
just to receive and to not worry about time and um, to really truly be. It was the third part of the book that was the hardest to write because when they came back and said, write this and kind of gave me some guidelines, it, the, the free flowing form was gone. So now it was structure kind of imposed. I have to write a chapter. And that in alone, what I just said, that's language. And that's what I would rec have people recognize. If you start saying, I have to do this, it's always going to be harder. Oh, I get to write a new chapter. I get to share more of my expertise. It puts it in a very, very different light. That's a little coaching trick right there. And so people who are successful in the medical field, do they possess certain characteristics that make them successful? There is a very high and deep skill set, obviously, for all medical professionals of all different backgrounds. Um, there's a lot of learning, like you talked about earlier, and, and a lot of training and a lot of school and a lot of internship and all that. But like what we talked about earlier, that's not what they teach you, right? Like my, my program is not what they teach you in, in pharmacy school. It's everything else about being a business owner and, and actually bringing a work out to the world or birthing a work. Nobody teaches you how to do that. Nobody is there for you. And, and there's, no, there's nobody like there's just like a birth, uh, like someone who's going to help someone midwife, right? A, a birth. There's nobody here to do that for your business. There's coaches. And and I think that um, that's something that really, that's the deep work, inner, inner work that you have to do on your own as an entrepreneur. So people in medical field, whether the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, or whatever they might be, how do they keep up to date with everything, right? Do that continue to go back to school? Like if I'm a doctor at a hospital, is the hospital paying for me to keep up to date with everything? Or is this a pretty much a personal responsibility? Some do, and you know, for, you know, going back to that same original point, they're doing it squarely in where they, where they live. Like, so most pharmacists or physicians, they will keep up their own CEs or CMEs, right? They're continuing education credits and units on their own. Some companies pay for it. Most don't. I would say most don't. Um, in, in my industry, in the pharma industry, when I was in industry, they would pay for some professional development. So you've heard of companies, you know, doing uh, like the Stephen Covey seven habits type of course. So that's one of the things that we're doing with Corpreneur University and Corpreneur Academy is going into businesses and saying, will you um, actually going to, you know, going in through HR and saying, will you actually build up your teams and build up your employees from the inside out? Because they're more likely to stay in the company because they're going to be more likely to be innovative. Companies really aren't doing enough of this. So you talked before about, you know, doing public speaking. So you talk about the points of doing public speaking as an entrepreneur and how do you personally get ready to, you know, to speak in public? Like, is there that sort of process you go through to get ready? Yeah. Um, years ago, I would say back in the early 90s, you know, late 80s, early 90s, I graduated Villanova University in 91. And I remember taking my very first like speech and communications class, obviously in high school. Also, I was in an all girls private Catholic high school. So I was able to take like debate and all that. So I guess I've always kind of had those classes leading up to what a public speaking opportunity would be my very first true public speaking professional opportunity was right in my own company. I was a, I was a scientist and clinical research uh, scientist and, and leader, study leader, global study leader at Smith Klein Beecham. And my boss at the time was a Harvard physician. And he said, you're going to go to London next week and you're speaking in front of 800 physicians. And I was like, no, no pressure, no pressure, <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. Right. I didn't even have a passport. I remember having to go and get my passport. Like they had to sign papers. So I fast tracked the passport. Like I had to go down to the, uh, the passport, whatever office in Philadelphia and sign everything and get my picture. I looked terrible that day. It was raining. I was like, I'm ready to go to London. Right. I'm, I'm packing for my first business trip. And then he coached me and he said, I, I mean, I wrote the protocol and I was going to present the protocol that I wrote to these physicians who were going to then use my protocol on their patients. And I got to the point where I, you know what? I did the PowerPoint. I'm going to do the presentation. I'm fine. And I said to my boss, what if they ask questions? I'm going to point at you and you're going to answer the questions. And he's like, Anne, who's the expert? And I was like, oh, I am. Right. I'm, I'm the expert. 
I wrote the protocol. You didn't even, I know more than you boss. Right. It was so, it was just that little disconnect. And I said, well, but just in case, you know, this was sort of, this is a pharmacy joke. And I, I was like, just bring, you know, bring a, a heart rate lowering medication for me in case I need, cause I was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I was fine. And then he's sitting there like in the second row and he's just like, leaning back with like the way he used to, he just, he would like joke with me all the time and laugh. And he's just leaning back, like, he, 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 like laughing. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reading my notes. And then, you know, physician number one asked a question, physician number two, nurse number one, you know, pharmacist three. And I just answered every single question. And he's just laughing. He's like, look at you, you're a total pro. And I would say, so I was super nervous. I am a natural extrovert. So for me, I got over it fast, but in other speaking, when it's, when it's something that's in you, there's a difference in speaking out your truth. When there's something that you're connected to in your core, in your spirit, in something that you believe in to the very core of your being. So like your great work, your destiny stuff, when you're actually in that space, sometimes it's even scarier to speak out because you don't want your words to be wrong because you know how important it is inside because you want to make sure. And then in that instance, you have to remind yourself, I'm the expert. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. They want your story. You're just a human like them. They're going to listen to you. You're going to speak their language, whether you get all the words right or not. So just get out there, go past that border bully, which is the fear of public speaking, which is the number one fear that people have. So yeah, to your point, people have that fear, but they can do it whether they're introverted or extroverted. And in fact, most people, I'd say I'm actually on the test, like on the, I have enough introverted in me on those tests, you know, like Myers-Briggs and all that, that allow me to sit down and write a book when I need to. But I also like to get out there and both energize me. You know, so I could, sometimes I just need time by myself to be re-energized. And sometimes I can't wait to, I can't wait to get on a plane again and go to a conference, right? My husband's the same way. And we met in that industry. So, so it really depends on um, how you want to do things. This is a, this is a platform right now. I'm on your stage. Sometimes it's a, it's a physical stage that, you know, behind a podium. And sometimes it's a stage with no podium. Sometimes it's your own stage that you build as an entrepreneur. Whatever stage that is, don't be afraid of it. Just embrace it and walk on it and be yourself and just tell your story. It's the story that actually attracts. People want to know our weaknesses. They want to know our disabilities. They want to know what hurts. They want to know what we got wrong. And it's okay to share all those things and not be the fakes and phonies that are out there on social media land <laughs> trying to tell you and sell you and yeah, all that kind of yucky stuff. Yeah, I remember when COVID first hit and the lockdown came down, like all the intro, intro was like, oh, yes, no more people. I stayed at home by myself. I love this. <laughs> and the extroverts were like literally dying. Like they didn't know what to do. Yeah, it, it was like, it was, it was crazy how the dynamics, dynamics started off, you know. So, Ann, talk more about your podcast a little bit. Okay. So the Corpreneur podcast, I tell on my very first episode, if you go and download that and subscribe on my very first episode, I tell about my story in 2008. I talk about exhaustion, moving across the country. I, I, I talk about how the wheel downloaded for me and people really find that story um, uh, really, really enlightening. And that was how the Corpreneur podcast really started getting momentum. And then I started getting like top mentors and other seven figure producers on my show and other healthcare professionals on my show. So this year is going to be a focus now, you know, as season two is starting to be released, it's going to be a focus on healthcare professionals and healthcare professionals turning into entrepreneurs and turning into corepreneurs. Um, and it's not like other entrepreneur shows. It's what makes you tick on the inside? Why do you start your business? And what do you do when the chips are down? What do you do when that negative core four, when all things are chaotic and overwhelmed and resistance and exhaustion is just your norm? And how do you pivot or, or change your mindset, which is where you need to change? You know, that's like what wakes you up in the middle of the night with your mind going and you can't think and your to-do list is never to done. Um, these are the things that like successful entrepreneurs have learned to overcome. 
So those are the questions that I ask on the Corpreneur podcast. And I also like, you know, I, I, I believe in this, right? I believe in the coach that pulls me up and I believe in pulling someone else up. So um, when, when people give me a great rating or review on the podcast and they leave their name, and if they are a business owner, I shout them out on my podcast. I always try to help other people. Like I said, I don't have a competitive mindset. So Jason, if you subscribe, I will totally shout your business out. And that's just one more thing to help you with the Cavness experience and, and, and Cavness HR and um, the crowdsourcing that you're doing. I looked into that and I, I wish you the very best on Thank that. Thank you. You're welcome. So, and um, as you know, entrepreneurship is not for everyone, right? But then again, you no know, people will say, never quit, don't give up, keep on going, you know. There was, a, there was a meme where somebody's in a like, coal mine and they stop right before they get to the diamond. But having said that, is there a point in time where someone could stop and get together nine to five? Like, I'm not talking about just pivot, like they maybe started two or three companies and not working out and it's, it's, they can't figure it out, right? So right. Someone actually stop and not be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, it, absolutely. And I've done it, right? And I know other very, very well-to-do entrepreneurs that have done it. They've put the brakes on. In fact, I was sitting at this desk. It was 2006. I had just launched a version of the Corpreneur Academy. And I had a 16 week cohort of people go through my coach training program. And I'm right in the middle of it. And it was fine, but it was taking a lot of my time and things were not well in my body. So I was going through a physical thing that I didn't even know yet. And I had to have, eventually I had to have a partial hysterectomy. So I didn't really realize I had, you know, this tumor and all this kind of stuff. Everything was benign. Everything was fine, but I was like feeling different. And I'm sitting here. If we understand our sense of intuition and vision, I'm a visionary type. So I'm sitting here and it was like, this big round button was right in front of me. It was like my spirit knew better than what I was doing. Uh, my, my doerness, I was doing, doing, doing. But like there was this big giant button and it said pause. And pause doesn't mean stop, but it means pause. And it didn't say how long to pause, but it was like, okay, God, is that you? You know, okay, I'll pause after I'm done this cohort or I'm pause, I'll pause when you wheel me into the hospital. Do you know? Cause that's how sometimes type A's are. And and there's a lot of like, Ariana Huffington has a story like that, like where she broke her jaw because she was so overworked. And I think because we have a lot of type A's are the type that do start businesses. They are the type that burn out in their own businesses, just like they burned out in their companies. And that's huge. So pause means pause. And for me, I had to, I had to pause. And I found out my husband, after my surgery, my husband was getting a job in Chicago and I didn't know anybody in Chicago. I didn't know the pharmaceutical industry in, the, in Chicago. So I thought I'm going to pause what I'm doing with the second company and I'll just be RXER. So I pitched um, my company to um, a company in Chicago. And I said, I can come and help you with your medical information teams. And they said, but we can't afford that right now. We only have room for an internal employee. And I had had that leading I knew that I heard or saw the word pause and I said, okay. So I took a job for a little while and that 18 month period that I took that job was so critical because it was like, I fast tracked what was going on inside the industry that I wasn't seeing outside the industry in clients. I saw an acceleration that now I feel and perceive that I didn't see or, or feel that was coming before because it was mergers and divestitures and all these things that from the internal perspective of the teams and the leaders of the teams, man, I was put on a fire. That was very different than my GlaxoSmithKline and my SmithKline Beecham experience. So for me, it sharpened my skills and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you need to stop, go back, take a job for a little while or stop, try another business. There's nothing wrong with learning how to do things, right? Edison tried a lot of different ways how to not make a light bulb until he made a light bulb. And can you talk in more detail about your two companies, like how they came about, why you started them? What, what, what are they, what are you focusing on them right now and, and your vision for both of them? Yes. My vision for RXCR communications is really to become more aligned, just like I'm walking my talk in Corpreneur and for my, for my clients in Corpreneur, I'm doing the same thing in my business RXCR right now. I'm re 
calibrating what my core really wants to work with. So I actually, I'm, I'm turning away more jobs than I ever have. When someone says, would you like to, you know, would you like to help this oncology, uh, you know, big corporation? I say, you know what, I'd rather help right now this startup. And I don't want to grow this company to just scale and be a competitor with all these other companies. I want me and my teams to focus just on what really we're passionate about. I'm, I'm passionate about um, burnout. I'm, I'm passionate about CNS, right? The central nervous system types of disorders, um, anxiety, depression, and how to flip that. So as a pharmacist, what am I passionate about there is non-pharmacological intervention. And then that's where Corpreneur comes in. So the Corpreneur, how can you build a business and balance your life and leave your legacy? People come to me and they want to build their business. What they don't realize is really they need to balance their life to do that. So people never look, oh, I need life balance. But now it's now since the pandemic and since things have been so incredibly out of balance, people are now understanding. It's finally like the, the message that I received back in 2009 is finally landing. It, it's like a lot of entrepreneurs, this is another point, a lot of entrepreneurs, we see a vision of a world, a future world, a better future world. And that vision isn't for today. It's we're working through creating that vision. So clarifying that for my clients is going to be really important for who we really um, will work with. And the only way to truly know that is to try and to not succeed. I don't like to use the word fail. It's just to not succeed and learn how to do it maybe a better way after you do a little bit of market research with your initial responders. And are there any product tools that you use to increase your productivity that you want to share with us? Yes. The core wheel, which I showed you earlier, you know, I'll show it again. And the way that came about is that there are, you know, there are typical tools out there that never have truly worked. One of them is the life balance wheel that coaches know about. And there are typically look like a piece of pie. It looks like just a regular slice of pie with eight sections. And one of those sections, for example, I'll just give an example was that that resonated with me back in 2008 was spirituality because they were like, OK, well, how do you rank this? How do you rank each of these areas of your wheels, your career, your finances, your health, your service, your, you know, your your personal life, your social life? How do you rank these types of you know areas of your wheel? And there's two philosophies in coaching is that you either lead from your strengths or you pull up your weaknesses. So people could clearly do a life balance wheel exercise and see their weaknesses, but not know how to pull them up and how is where people get stuck. Or they could see, okay, I can lead from my strengths. And the philosophy there was that if I, if my strength was spirituality or if my strength was my career, then that should bring up all the other areas. But if you're ranking one of the areas of your wheel, let's just say you rank your career at a nine and it's all the way up here. How's that going to pull up your finances at a two? It's only going to pull it up one. So both of them had flawed philosophies. And now I realize, okay, that's, that's why God kind of make this download in me, this scientist, this out of balance, overworked scientist. He chose me to work it out on myself. <laughs> and this tool is so interdimensional because now it's a body, mind, spirit look at what your life looks like and it's not ranked the same way these worn out linear business models don't work anymore and when i unpack this method the core which i call the core you know the core method the corepreneur method um it, all with my corepreneurs they are mind blown because they now have something that when they're laying in bed at night and and all those thoughts come they can immediately pivot and start moving into their space. So for example, let's just say I say, what's in your core, Jason? And, 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 and maybe you answered, you know, one of your values, one of your key values is integrity or one of your key values is love or one of your key values is, um, I don't know. So let's just say, let's just say integrity. And if, if integrity is here, then I can ask you, okay, what are some things that um, you've tapped into all your life for integrity. And you might come up with a phrase or a scripture or a saying, or you might think of a person or a mentor in your life that, that would hold something of integrity that never, that you knew didn't lie. 
but then you find a client right here that's lying or you, you have, or you're lying to yourself in some way, like, and this is in your mind section. So this is your body, your mind, and your spirit. So in your mind, you're, you're, you got your time wasters, your time stealers, your interruptions, the crisis, and your brain can play tricks on you. So you might be out of integrity or lying to yourself in some way, shape or form, which psychology knows that we all lie. So if integrity is one of your core values, at some point, you're going to have a disconnect in this area. And that's just one value, right? There are hundreds of values. So us as interconnected humans, we can have all these little disconnects. And this wheel helps you connect this back to your core again, so that what you're doing is the same as how you're feeling inside. So you don't get that um, that, that disconnect in your mind and allows you to overcome that on an instance. Now that's something that I take my clients through obviously in a program. So it's a lot more than we can do on the show today, but that gave you a little, an example that right now, if you feel uncalibrated with what you're doing versus the job you're going to every day, who you are and the values that you stand for versus the job that you're doing, eventually you're going to be like that client of mine that said, I'm a VP at a bank and I'm quitting my day job because something's wrong. I can't take it anymore. And you know what? I'm happier. I'm happier. I'm broke and I'm happy and I'll start something new. And that's okay because she'll start something new that comes straight from her core. And that's when you can truly leave a legacy. So when you balance your life, then you can build your business. Then you can leave your legacy because something's really going to be from your heart, from your core. And when you are powered up from your core and using that, power, which for me, that's the Holy spirit right there talking through me. I mean, and I don't care what you call it or what your religion or background or whatever is it works for everybody. And I've had all kinds of amazing people in my program that once they get past their disconnect, boy, I've skyrocketed businesses. So it's just fantastic. So, and yeah, so with your corporate uh, process, you do a pretty intensive deep dive then. Yeah. It's deep inner work. And yes, I'm training them to be a coach, but they, they, they become their client zero. And it's, it's so healing from a soul level, you know, and I think that big businesses, corporate America, we've forgotten about the fact that of course, yes, in the U S we have a separation of church and state. We're not supposed to talk about religion or politics. We're not supposed to remember that we have a soul or a spirit or where innovation comes from. And, and people really want to have that conversation right now. And they want to be free to call it what they need. And, and I give them that space and that openness on my end. I use open in my world as well um, for them to open and un unlock that again. So back to your, your intensive deep dive. So there's a saying what iron sharp, iron sharp is iron, but a lot of people can't handle being sharpened by iron, right? They melt <laughs> away. How do you, how do you deal with those people who you might be like, not as like mentally strong as other people? And you have to like, you know, maybe hold back a little bit or how do you handle that? That's a, that's a really wonderful question because that is something that as a coach and as a consultant, I've decided who I want as my clients and I don't want the needy person, right? And not to say that I'm not going to help them. They can listen to the podcast for free. They can download my stuff for free. They can watch this interview here. I give a lot of my time, but I give it in a way that anybody can relate to. I wrote a book. They can pay for that for $8. I've, I've done it in a way that the person that like needs those self-coaching exercises at the end, I'm glad that very hard chapter for me to write was actually a blessing in disguise. Cause that's what they needed. You know, the time to, to answer the question and do it for themselves and, and give that introspection. Um, and then anybody can contact me for a session, but for my, for my clients, really the iron sharpens iron. I only want the iron, right? So there's a, so what I did is I created an application process for both my um, in-person live events, as well as my coach training program. Because when I pair people, I don't want to pair one leader with another leader. These are high performing leaders. And there are people that, man, you just know them. They, they think they can't, so they don't. Right. But I have a little thing on my wall over there that said she believed she could, she believed she could. So she did. And so there's people that one of the things you have to decide is who are your, who's your ideal client. My clients are those that believe they can. So when they dip down into, you know what, 
I'm not feeling good today. I'm really depressed and I'm down or whatever. I know that they're in there somewhere because I know that they already come from that place of alignment inside prior to entering any of my programs or my coaching. So I think that is the, the difference because I have had clients before that it's, man, it's like pulling teeth, client session after session. And it's not an energetic match, right? We all have energy and you know, when somebody uh, you're and you're and your core is shrinking to fit, I have to make sure my core is alive and energetic and expanded every single day. I have to do that. I have to make myself great every day. Like you advocate for Jason. I believe in that. And, um, I, one of the things that I ask my clients, are you the type that does what I do? Like, do you, it doesn't have to be in the morning, but you know, do you keep a journal where you have automatic writing and you just let it all flow in a positive way? Um, or are you the type that just wants to like, dear diary, here's how it all hurts so bad. No, 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 no. And if you do that, that's great. I have to do that every once in a while. And that's the kind I rip up or I burn it or whatever, but it, it's, or I, or I let it back into, you know, the light where it's just going to dissipate. And, uh, and that's, that's where, you know, we all have that spirit nature that knows better. And we have the soulish nature that could be attached to the flesh that like, uh. so getting into iron is, is I'm ready for an iron sharp, sharpening iron coach. And I want that type of client That's why I really, I try to screen for it. That's really important for an entrepreneur to do. And understand you have some, something for our listeners today. I do. I have a couple things. So if you are wanting to start a business, and even if you've started a business and it hasn't been as successful as you want, maybe you didn't take the time to kind of go through the steps of what's it look like to go from corporate to freedom? Because that for me is a lot more than quitting your day job and just starting a business that's successful. That's a mindset shift of who's my successor? How do I leave my um, successor behind? Because you could be somebody in a company that just wants to go to like maybe from director to VP level. And then maybe eventually in five years or so, you want to start your own company. Start now. So download the corporate to freedom checklist from my website, anrvzu.com, and you'll see a pop-up. You can also find out about my masterclass. Now there's a form on my website. I don't have the site up for the masterclass, but soon it will be corpreneur.com masterclass or anrvzu.com masterclass. I have a masterclass coming up on May 11th, and that will be a free masterclass. That's a way that I can multiply myself and teach the top three things that I know every business owner needs to know. So um, those things are going to be coming soon. I am, and uh, I'll start getting that up on my website soon. But just if, if you have downloaded my, um, my corporate to freedom checklist, or if you've sent me a note and it, and it contacts me, then you'll be in my system. And, and you'll hear about it when I email my list. And Anne, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. I am mostly, I'd say on LinkedIn, that's where my professional audience is. I like Twitter as well. I'm on Clubhouse, so invite me to speak. If, you, uh, if you're a pharmacist listening to this, I love to get on with the pharmacists on Clubhouse. And um, I, I also love to get on with the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneur groups on Clubhouse. Uh, so just find me, Ann Arvizu, right, uh, at LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I have two pages on Facebook, the Corpreneur page. Um, I have a Connect group, Corpreneur Connect. That's my private group. And I just started just inviting people to that group. So that's right now, it's just been women, and I'm okay with that. I have a retreat that I'm doing later this year, the From the Core Retreat. So you'll see that on my website as well, if you want to, uh, you know, apply for that and to, um, yeah, find me all over social media. I'm social and I follow back. So yeah, Instagram too, Instagram. And to our listeners, we have the link to our gifts and the social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetatesarbolar.com. And also be sure to support our crowdfunding campaign at HTTPS cabinethr.co slash crowdfunding. And so what can I, well, first of all, Anne, is there anything I sort of asked you that I did, did not ask you? Jason, this was so fun talking with you today. Um, you know, I just applaud you for your 
uh, your knowledge of getting this tech stuff done, right? I've never even done a live stream before. So, you know, I learned something from you today. Thank you for your show and your experience and for helping other entrepreneurs stay great and be great and learn to be great every day. That's such an important message. And I love what you're doing for businesses and putting HR in them. You didn't, didn't need to ask me one more question. I wish I could ask you some questions. Maybe I'll have to get you on the Corpreneur podcast and uh, pick your heart and find out what's, what's in your core. Yes. And so do, can you give us any advice on wisdom? Anything else, anything else you want to talk about? Oh gosh, just staying true to your core, being who you are, learning that you can do it no matter what. I mean, um, you know, you're an ex-veteran. Uh, I'm a woman in my fifties uh, that's retired from my industry and yeah, we can do it. And if, if you have it inside, if there's that idea that you have in, inside, that's what, you know, shows like this experience are all about of finding out what makes entrepreneurs tick. This is such a great conversation. So be true to yourself and um, know that you can do it. And thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me here. It's been an honor. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.